getting there. Very good, very good. All right, there are several that we need to remember in our prayers. Uh, some of you may not have heard that Sam Maudlin is in the hospital and they've discovered that he has cancer and it has spread and uh, they're going to be looking at beginning chemotherapy. Uh, but uh, please keep Kimberly and Mike and Laura and Ray in your prayers as well as Sam. It's a very difficult time. But if I remember what Laura said correctly, he's in ICU right now and uh, having a very difficult time. So uh, they just learned about that last week. So learned that it was cancer. They knew that he was having some difficulties. But anyway, Keep him in your prayers. Also, Brother Doyle and Wigan is back in the hospital. Uh, I believe it's pneumonia. And so I want you to keep him in your prayers as well. Uh, who else do we need to remember? Kathy Pate. You continue to pray for her. Cindy. Cindy's stepmom, Marie, is going to be having a hip replacement, she said. Surgery. So keep her in your prayers. Who else? There are many others that are having health issues that uh, we want to continue to pray for. Uh, Michael is back with us. Uh, and Shauna has gone to New York, right? Yeah, and so keep her. She'll be having medical tests while she's up there. So keep her in your prayers, please. Who else? All right, then. If you'll bow with me, we'll go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we humbly bow before your throne with hearts that are grateful. We thank you for your son, Jesus. We know, dear God, that that was very difficult to send him to pay the price for our sins. But it demonstrated your great love for us, O oh God, and we're so thankful for that love. And we're thankful that you have made the way through him for us to come to you and to make our prayers uh, before your throne. Thank you so much for this opportunity that we have to lift up our hearts to you. Dear Lord, we bring Sam before your throne as well as Doyle. Uh, dear Lord, ask that you watch over them and be with them in their sickness. Be with Maria. Watch over her, dear God. Bless her in the ways that are needed. Pray, dear Lord, also that you'll continue to be with others who are struggling with their health issues. Many of our number here, dear God, and who are close, dear to our hearts. But we know that you look down upon each one of them. But dear Lord, we pray that you offer your special attention at this time to be thy will and that these will be restored to their health, O oh God. We pray, dear Lord, also that you will be with our nation. We are facing struggles, dear Lord, of, of those who ignore the morals that you have laid out for us, ignore the love that we're to have for our neighbors, who ignore the good that is supposed to be done, dear God, and perpetuate the evil that Satan would have them to do. There are hearts that are aching, dear God. There are funerals that are being observed at this time because of such evils as that. We pray, dear Lord, that if it be thy will, if it be any way possible, O oh God, that these things would come to an end, that this indeed would uh, turn back to you, that people would have a change of heart and desire to please you in their lives, and to do your will, follow what your word teaches us. Just walk in the steps of your son, Jesus. Help us, dear God, to be that light for those who are 
walking in darkness that they might see you. They might desire to turn and to follow after you. We pray, dear God, that you'll strengthen us as we live in this world, that our faith in you will not be turned away or weakened, dear God, but indeed we'll trust even more in you because of our need, because we cannot save ourselves, O oh God, but you are the one who is able. So help us, O oh God, in these things and the times that we're living. Help us to be strong. Help us to help others, dear God. May indeed your will be done in all things. Bless us as we go through this Bible class that we might indeed glorify you and learn those things that we might need, that our faith may be strengthened, O oh God, and that you will receive all the glory. Forgive our sins, O oh God, for we often fall short. We leave things undone that we should do, and we do things that we should. But dear Lord, we lay it at your feet and ask for the blood of your Son. Make us holy and righteous before you. Again, we thank you for Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. All right. We're going to continue uh, with our study in Philippians, and we're going to rehearse briefly some things that we have gone over, and then we're going to move into some new material. And open up to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter, well, we're going to start in chapter 1, though. Uh, yeah. All right, and so remember that the people of Philippi were separated from one another. Paul was separated from them. But they were longing for one another, and they were praying for one another. And they were enjoying exercising the fellowship in the ways that they could with one another. Even though Paul was in prison, he still considered himself to be in their fellowship or in fellowship with them. Uh, in that heart, joined to heart, that spirit joined to spirit. Even though they couldn't be face to face, they were together in that way. And then they were enjoying a strong unity with each other. They were mindful of the impact of their actions upon others. And then look at chapter 1, verse number 1. Somebody read that, please. Philippians 1, verse 1. Now here in this verse... How does Paul describe himself and Timothy? Servants, bond servants, and literally the word here is slave. That's who he was, but a slave of who? Jesus Christ. Can there be a more benevolent Lord? Can there be one that loves his servants more than him? There cannot be. And in fact, not only uh, provides that love and that care, but also he provides a home. He provides a place for us to live when this world comes to an end. And so he is doing more. He is going above and beyond. And that, that is a pun if you didn't notice there. Uh, he's going above and beyond what, what might normally be thought of concerning a master. But Paul here is not writing this in a shameful way. He starts the letter this way. He is a voluntary servant. And yet there is a something that is bound upon him. New King James says bond servants. And that means you owe a debt. You are there for a purpose. There's a genuine obligation that is engaged in here. And so Paul is saying that this is something that all the saints, all those who have been purchased with the blood of Jesus have in common. And so our unity needs to be based in the fact that we are all servants and saints of Jesus Christ. Servants of and saints through Jesus. That's who we are. Uh, how many, let me see a show of hands and you may not still be working, but maybe you have something that you're doing. How many of you love what you are doing right now in your life? I do. In loving what you're, are there other people involved in what you're doing? 
do you grow a kinship, a relationship with them? You better believe you do. You better believe. And this is only natural. There's a reason that you love it, and it may be the job itself. It may be your employer itself. It may be your supervisor. It may be your co-workers that make it such a wonderful job to be at. And I hope Martha and Charlene feel the same way I do. <laughs> but uh, it is such a joy to come into this work. It is work, by the way. And those ladies work, I tell you. Mm very diligent in their service uh, in this good way. And y'all only see a few small things of what they do. The church bulletin and the phone tree and some things like that. But they do a lot of work in many different areas of the congregation here. And there is a kinship among us office workers in that. And we don't have any hard feelings, any withdrawals. We don't dread coming into the office. We love, we enjoy being with each other and being in the work here. But then also on Sunday, we enjoy being with all the saints. We enjoy being with this. But my illustration is this, that we build a relationship with those who are in a like situation with us. What about someone who shares a similar illness that you've had or have? Do you, do you build a bond with them? Sure you do. Uh, when you're going through experiencing some of the things that someone else has experienced and they are able to help you, they're able to encourage you as you go through it, and then you are able to encourage someone else. I always remember he may talking about going to physical therapy up in Midtown Atlanta. And he was griping and complaining about his pain in his shoulders. And he has severe pain in his shoulders. He was he has a right to complain, but you know, he doesn't you won't hardly ever ever hear him complain, but he has a lot of pain in his shoulders, struggles with migraines and he didn't ask me to say that and probably wouldn't want me to tell people, but he said he was there and he was moaning and complaining and about to get in the pool to do some therapy and uh, the fellow who was already in the pool said, hey, what's going on? He, oh, man, I got all this going on. I, you know, what are you complaining about? And he was sharing with him the things that he was complaining about and lo and Behold, the fellow that was talking to him and encouraging him was paralyzed. He may have said he learned a good lesson that day. He learned a good lesson. You heard the uh, story about the man who complained about his feet hurting until he met a man with no feet. That's uh, something to think about, isn't it? Something to think about. And so, but here Paul had a relationship. Paul had some things in common with the people at the church at Philippi. And so he's writing about those things. He begins the letter by saying, we have some things in common and I'm thinking about these things and I want you to think about them too. Isn't that a pleasant thing you know we come in we ask well, how you doing today we walk into the building or such and uh, we want to have that relationship we want to have that kinship that bond together as we strive to do what God would have us to do and this is important as you and I build our relationship that we know that Paul here was doing that very thing, but he says it is in Christ. I'm a bondservant of Jesus Christ. And so not only is it something that we do in order to build a relationship, but it is also a responsibility. 
a responsibility that you and I have. Why did Jesus leave heaven? Luke 19.10, right? He came to seek and to save. Let me ask you. As a bondservant of Jesus Christ, every Christian is a bondservant of Jesus. Have you set in your heart to seek someone? Have, have you put in your heart yourself Say, I'm going to seek out someone. And then why are you going to seek them out? Well, why did Jesus seek out someone? Because he wanted a relationship with you. God sent Jesus because God wants a relationship with you. Jesus came because he wants a relationship with you. Now, too many times we look at ourselves in the mirror and say, well, I'm just not worth it. And because I'm not worth it, then I'm not going to be busy doing my service. If I'm not worth it, who's going to think that I'm worth it? Nobody else is going to think. If I don't think I'm worth it, nobody else is going to think I'm worth it. They're not going to listen. They're not going to be influenced or encouraged by me. And so we let it slide. But what I want you to get is that Paul, being a bondservant of Jesus Christ, he was about following Jesus, that he was seeking. And then those that he found, he continued building a relationship with them. Because God sent Jesus to build that relationship. Jesus came and died to build that relationship. And now you and I, are we seeking? Are we seeking? Why did Paul write the letter? Well, you say he was inspired. God told him to. Well, it's still being a servant though, right? He's still doing what God wants him to do. And he's still seeking to build up that relationship. And think about this. What if Paul had not wrote the letter to the Philippians? What if Paul had just said, well, you know, I, I got so much that they've beaten me and I, I got to worry about getting enough food. I got to worry about all these people that are coming and laying their troubles on me and I got too much going on right now to write a letter to the Philippians. One of the greatest letters of the New Testament would be missing, but the study of joy, the, the lesson on rejoicing in Jesus Christ would be missing if Paul said, well, you know, I know God wants me to write this letter. I know the brethren there need encouragement, but I'm just... I'm not where I can right now. Y'all may not realize it, but Robert here spends a lot of time emailing and writing letters to the brethren out in the islands. And the encouragement that he gives to them, he talks to them on the phone as well, is something that is tremendous blessing. He can't be out there right now at this moment, but guess what? He's still building that relationship with them. He's still encouraging, exhorting them uh, to do what God wants them to do as the saints and servants of Jesus. If Paul had not written the letter to the Philippians, do you think some of them might have become discouraged rather than encouraged? You know, Paul came here and preached to us and he uh, led us to Jesus, but then he forgot about us. Hmm. What if some of those, you know, back in chapter four, there was a couple that were fighting, uh, uh, Syntyche and who was the other one? Eurotica. Uh, they were having a dispute. Well, what if Paul hadn't written this letter. What if nobody helped them? And what if their dispute became a split? 
And one of them said, you know what? I'm not going to go and worship where that person worships. What if one of them had fallen away from the faith? We don't know the end of what happened, but we do know that Paul fulfilled what he was supposed to do in writing to them and encouraging them in the way that he did. And if he had failed to do that, on the day of judgment, when he saw if one of them fell away, if both of them fell away, if he had not written to them, Sometimes the elders will bring a name up before the congregation and say, if you have any influence, if you have any way of contacting or reaching out to this person uh, because they've gone the wrong way, they've gone astray. And we say, well, you know, I, I don't have time. I don't have, it'd be good to do that, but I don't have any influence. I don't. And we think of various reasons not to contact this person. They fall away. Remember Jesus came to seek and to save. And so here Paul, even though he wasn't there in their presence, he's writing and exhorting them, listen, We need to act like bond servants. We need to be united through Jesus Christ in doing the things that Jesus would have us to do. And so that is one of the things that you and I can can do in a way that is serving God. Any comments or questions about that? All right, look at chapter 4, verse 21. Chapter 4, verse 21. Robin, would you read that, please? You know, I've been places where I didn't get to speak to everyone who was present. And there's been a time or two that people have been offended because the preacher didn't come up and speak to me. I was sitting there on the pew and he never came by. There have been visitors who were offended because the preacher didn't speak to them. I make it a point that I'm scanning the audience before worship begins. And if I see a face that I don't recognize, then I make a point to go over and introduce myself. I want to greet them. I want to let them know that they're welcome and uh, have that. People appreciate that. They expect it from the preacher. But every now and then, I'll miss one. Every now and then. Maybe busy doing something else. You know, there are technical problems or whatever might be going on. Somebody else has a situation they want to talk to me about. uh, So it's not always that I can do that. But I try. And one reason is because I want to be uh, with that, uh, for example, what if a member of the church is traveling and comes and visits with us? They love to speak to the preacher. Most of them do. They're saints, right? And so we already have a kinship. We already have a connection. I haven't met them before, perhaps, but they are coming because we have a connection. And that connection is that we are saints in Jesus Christ. And so they've come for a reason. They want a relationship. They want to worship, yes. But also they want to do it with fellow Christians, right? 
And so that's what we're striving to do is that we are worshiping together with the saints. Look at that again. Greet every saint in Jesus Christ. Everyone. And so Paul here at the end of his letter, he wants the greetings to come from him, of course. You let the people know. And so uh, whenever I talk with Boyette over in Saipan or send an email or whatever, it's normally that I will end my letter with uh, give our love to the brethren. Uh, please don't forget to tell the brethren uh, our greetings. That, uh, we're looking forward to being with you again or any other that is working out there that we communicate with. And so Paul did it, and we want to do the same thing. We can pattern ourselves. Remember, he's writing to the church, and so we can learn a pattern from him. Uh, I've received already several birthday cards, and thank you all for everyone. Uh, my birthday is tomorrow, by the way. It'll be 62. See, it doesn't seem, I, I feel like I should be 35, you know? Uh, Jack Benny, 39. Uh, but uh, anyway, we need to be sure that we're communicating with the saints. And we're striving to do it with all of them. That we don't just have uh, a small little group that we're connected to, but we want to make sure that we're connected with the whole group. And it may not be uh, as close as, you know, two or three friendships that you have in the church, but we're brothers and sisters. We're a family. And if you have a family and that family never gets together for reunions, your family never calls you, you never hear from them, can you say honestly that you are really close to your family? Hmm. Sunday night for the Savior is an important work. It's not just something that we do to waste paper and ink. It is something we do to encourage the saints and others. And so that is something that is good that helps us to be unified in this way. And then look at chapter 1, verse number 8. Chapter 1, verse 8. Michael, would you read that, please? Chapter 1, verse 8. with the affection of Jesus Christ. And remember we began earlier about talking how that God sent Jesus. Jesus came to seek and to save. And he did it, they did it, because of love. Remember John 3, 16? For God so what? Love. He loved the world. Friends, it's always a, a good thing, I think, to make it personal. For God so loved me. I'm included in the world. You're included in the world. And so God so loved you. And so you and I, we are to have that similar affection that Paul is expressing here. He longed for them, but it was a longing not just because they may have been of the same nation, or they may have been of the same uh, vo vocation, tent makers, you know, Apollos and Aquila, Priscilla, uh, tent makers. Uh, that wasn't why they had this connection together. This connection, this tie, this bind that they had together was because of Jesus. And so Paul says, Jesus had affection for me. Now I'm going to have affection for you. And so we have this longing for each other and its foundation is in Jesus. So friends, this is one of the things that you and I have to grow in our understanding. 
And I want to use an illustration here that is not exactly parallel, but there are some parallels to it. One of the things that uh, is going on in the world today is the leaking of that uh, brief from the Supreme Court about abortion that Roe v. Wade may be overturned when they make their ruling on that. And there's great, what shall I say, consternation. Is that a good word? Great consternation on the part of some that a right that they believe they have is going to be overturned by the Supreme Court. And then there is jubilation on the other side of that issue that the Supreme Court is going to rule in favor of life. And this is based upon a relationship that we have in this country with law. And it may be that they rule the other way. I don't know how they're going to rule. And that's not the issue here. But the issue is that we have placed our fear or our rejoicing in the hands of men rather than the hands of God. We're looking to men to heal sin. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't rejoice if the uh, Supreme Court reverses Roe v. Wade. Uh, this would be a good thing in my opinion, but it still, by conservative minds, many, that we're placing this in the hands of men rather than looking to God as the authority and guide in our lives. The Supreme Court is not the ultimate judge. And we must not look at them in that way. Now, our relationship with each other sometimes gets confused with our worldly ways or worldly thinking. In other words, I like you, but it's because that you and I have common interests. You and I have a common Savior. You and I, but Paul is saying here that we need to step to a higher level. We need to bring our relationship with one another, not based upon the thinking of men, but rather because of the divine nature of our relationship. That it is superior, that it, it is going to be eternal, that it's going to outlast. It is far more important that our affection for each other be founded in Jesus Christ. Because when our affection is founded in Jesus Christ, what's going to destroy that affection? When a young couple decides to get married, they may have a lot of eros love and little understanding about agape love. If they can grasp hold of the concept of agape love, the divine, the godly love, that highest love, it will last and last and last. But if their concept of love is wholly based on eros, the physical love, the physical passes. We get old, don't we? <laughs> Doesn't stay the same.
Now teach me, brother. Got my keys, my pocket knife, lipstick. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Harry. When our relationship with each other is based on a divine affection rather than a worldly affection. Michael? Hmm. Convenience, yeah. And that, that puts a whole new picture on things, doesn't it? Yeah. Sure does. I want to challenge you. Think about that kind of affection that you have for the brethren here at Forest Park. And that we look at this verse, verse number 8. And that we make sure that our affection for our brethren here is based upon Jesus. It is patterned after Jesus. Rather than just being patterned after the world. Material things. This limited existence. This, as long as it's useful or convenient. Uh, that we base it on a deeper, longer lasting thing. And that is something that is essential to our being united together. Because look at chapter 2 verse 5. Chapter 2 verse 5. Karen, will you read that? Mm. Philippians 2 verse 5. This mind that was in Jesus was a mind of a divine origin. And I'm talking about his mind uh, was fixed on things eternal, things of God, rather than the material worldly things. Because if you read on down through verse number 8, he was willing to die. He was willing to give up the worldly in order to establish the heavenly. Remember, he came to seek and save the lost, to get, gain that relationship with us. And so, we are to have the mind of Christ and to have a deeper, longer lasting mindset rather than just the things that we can see. Remember, the things that are seen are temporary, the things that are eternal, things that are not seen are eternal. And so Jesus grasped hold of that concept and he kept on working for the eternal. He kept basing his relationships on the eternal. And even when he came and people hated him, people crucified him, and as they were mocking him on the cross, what did he ask of his father for them? Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. And so that is that desire to build that relationship that goes beyond the material, that goes beyond the worldly things that we often think of because the Jews, they were trying to hold on to their power in this world. They didn't realize they were giving up the power for eternal life in doing what they were doing. Because they were thinking in worldly terms. And so our affection needs to be based on a greater, on the eternal, on the divine, on God himself. And when we do that, our relationship with each other will change. It will grow. It will, friends, growing is a difficult thing, right? Growing, I mean real growth. Spiritual growth. Isn't that a difficult thing? 
Sometimes it is. Sometimes it's an epiphany that hits you, you know, and wow, why not? But sometimes it's hard because we have to work at it. Building a divine relationship with you, did it require Jesus to do some work? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And so you and I, we should be willing to put the time and the effort into building those relationships like Jesus took the time to build a relationship with you and with me. And that says I need determination. I need to decide I'm going to do this. I need to determine that I'm going to do that. Determination. And then I need action. Action. What is it? Plan the work, work the plan. And so how can you and I develop, and I want you to do this individually, but you develop a plan for yourself that you are going to grow in your affection for one another that is going to be based more in Jesus and less in the worldly concepts and that I'm going to work on developing the mind of Jesus for myself well building that relationship is a big part of it. with our fellow Christians that we have that mind of Christ and then look at chapter 4, verse 23. Well, our time has gone away. <clears throat> our time has gone away. Mike's getting up to ring the bell there. <clears throat> Somebody read verse 23 right quick. The grace of Jesus. Paul wanted that for all the Christians at Philippi and all Christians everywhere. He wants it for us today. So let's work on it. All right, but more next week, Lord willing. Thank you all.